everybody and welcome to Memorial United Methodist Church and to our digital worship service. We're so, so glad that you've chosen to join with us for these holy and sacred moments of worship together in Advent week number four. Can you believe it's only a week now until Christmas? We want you to join in as fully as possible in this service and we invite you to greet one another in the comments section of our YouTube page right now. If you have a prayer request, please share it in there. We love to be praying for you and with you, so please let us know how we can do that. Of course, we also want to know that you are here. So please go along to our website at some point, mumconline.com forward slash here. And when you get there, you will find our digital attendance pad and we would love it if you would fill it out. It really does help us. We are so glad to worship with you and we have a candle here in the sanctuary. We hope that you have one wherever you are worshiping and that you will light with us. As we light this candle, we are reminded that God is with us and that we are called to be and embody God's light in the darkness. As we worship today, I say the peace of Christ be with you. Good morning. Our scripture today is 1 John Chapter 4, verse 16b through 21, and it reads as follows. God is love, and those who abide in love abide in God, and God abides in them. Love has been perfected among us in this, that we may have boldness in the day of judgment, because as he is, so are we in this world. There is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear, for fear has to do with punishment, and whoever fears has not reached perfection in love. We love because he first loved us. Those who say, I love God, and hate their brother or sister are liars, for those who do not love a brother or a sister whom they have seen cannot love God whom they have not seen. The commandment is the commandment we have from him is this those who love God must love their brothers and sisters also. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. God of love, who reached down from heaven to draw us to your love. So fill our hearts with your love, that it spills out to all those around. For the sake of your Son, Jesus, who loved us and gave himself for us. Amen.
Brothers and sisters in Christ, will you join me in reciting the Apostles' Creed? I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, and suffered under Pontius Pilate. He was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Hi everybody, this is the fourth Sunday of Advent. And on this Sunday, we get to remember God's love. And one of the greatest gifts of God's love is Jesus. And we get to remember that this holiday season, that God sent his only son, our Lord Jesus Christ, to the earth to show how much he loved us. And this holiday season, too, you can share your love with your family and your friends. As you go through the season, you can make sure to tell people that you care for them. You can tell them, I love you. And you can also show your love by being kind and thoughtful. There are so many ways that we can celebrate God's love this Christmas. And one of the best ways is to make sure to open our heart to the Lord and thank him for the gift of love and for the gift of his son, Jesus Christ. Will you pray with me? Dear God, thank you for loving us. Thank you for your son, Jesus Christ. And thank you for this holiday season. In your son's name, we pray. Amen. And now we can find out how we can live out our calling memorial with just three things. We are in the fourth week of Advent, which means just one thing, Christmas is next week. So have you gone through and picked out which service you're going to be attending and bring your friends and family to? We have five Christmas Eve service options that you can pick from. So why don't we go through them real quick, shall we? All ages will want to join us at 3.30 p.m. in the sanctuary for our family service when children will have a hand in telling the Christmas story. It is always very fun. At 5 o'clock, we have a contemporary service, which will be in Maxwell Hall with our praise band. 
Then at 7 o'clock, we'll have our traditional service in the sanctuary with our choir. This service always seems to fill up fast, so you may want to come early. Or you can join us online because that service at 7 p.m. will also be live streamed on YouTube for our digital worship service for Christmas Eve. And for something a bit more quiet, join our 9 p.m. peaceful communion service in the sanctuary. And now while we're on the topic, I want to remind you of our special worship service times for Christmas Day and New Year's Day as well. On Christmas Day, we have one on-campus service and one digital service, both at 10 a.m. The on-campus service is in the sanctuary. Feel free to wear your Christmas jammies and join us for this special service. Our digital worship service is also at 10 a.m. and will be a live stream of that service in the sanctuary. On New Year's Day, we'll also have just one on-campus service at 10 a.m. in Maxwell Hall, and there will be a digital worship service going out at 11 a.m. on YouTube. So many ways for us to celebrate the birth of Jesus next week, and I hope you will bring a friend with you to one of those services. Now, Christmas is not always joyful for everyone, and it's not always a time to be happy. Some people feel lament or worry or sadness or missing a loved one around Christmas time. And in that same vein, I want to invite you also to our longest night worship service. It's often called Blue Christmas, and this is a special time of healing for those who are hurting during the holidays. We'll join alongside some of the other downtown church partners we have for this service, which will be outside Tuesday, December 20th at 6 p.m. on our front steps. Bring a candle or borrow one from us and bring a friend or a loved one whose spirit would benefit from this gentle service. Again, that's this Tuesday, December 20th at 6 p.m. on our front steps at Memorial. As you are giving and receiving gifts this week, I hope you'll take a moment to remember the people in our community who are not as fortunate. We have the Christmas Family Fund here, and when we find out about children, youth, or families in need in our area, that's when the Christmas Family Fund kicks in and our memorial elves go to work to make Christmas bright for those families. This is such an important gift and a confidential gift to our community. If you would like to help us replenish this fund, please consider giving a gift and putting Christmas Family Fund on the memo section of your check or selecting Christmas Family Fund when you give online. Remember, all this money stays in our community to help our neighbors make Christmas bright for their families. Celebrating the birth of Jesus with your friends and family at our Christmas Eve services, bringing a friend to the longest night service for hope and healing, and helping our community families have bright, fun Christmases through our Christmas Family Fund. These are just three things you can do to live your calling through Memorial. Time for our tithes and offerings. We have many ways that you can give to help the work of Memorial. You can see these on the website shown on the screen. I want to thank you for your gifts and your commitment to what God is doing through our church. Let us pray. Father God, thank you for loving us. Thank you for waking us up one more time. And thank you that you have blessed us with income that we can share with the church that the church shares with the community, with the state, with other countries in our missions. Father God, we are blessed to be blessed by you and continue to bless us as we bless others. Father God, we love you. We magnify your holy name. We ask you to touch those who give, touch those who have a desire to give and have nothing to give but love, prayer, and concern. And we thank you, Jesus, in your son's name, Lord. Amen. As we join together in prayer this morning, I remind you that you can always add your prayers to the comment feature to our community feed, where we will pray for them in real time, or you can go online to mumconline.com forward slash prayer and we will be happy to pray for you 24 seven. Let's pray. Wonderful God of hope, of peace, of joy, and of love. This Advent season, we wait with you for the birth of Jesus, your son. 
And as we draw near, we join together and seek to bring honor and glory to you and to him who we seek to emulate in, emulate in our lives. God, as we come before you, we ask that you give us your hope for the people around us, for our world that we live in. We, give, we ask that you give us your hope to not look at situations in our personal lives or in our community lives with hopelessness, but with your eyes of peace and of justice and of hope. God, we ask that you help us seek peace in our world, that we seek after your wholeness and beauty for all of your children and in all places of this earth, that we seek peace for your creation, for our neighbors, for ourselves, for our families, that we seek your peace. And God, we ask that you help us experience and be complete, as the scripture says, in your joy. That as we continue on in this Advent season, that we seek to be filled with your joy, not simple fleeting happiness, but a joy that passes all understanding, a joy that brings hope and peace to those around us, a joy even more than a kid on Christmas. Give us this joy. And today, O oh God, as we are thinking about love and as we are thinking about deep, deep, your deep love, we ask that you open our hearts today. You know each and every one of us and those, those things that we struggle to love, those people that we struggle to love, those situations that we have harshness towards. God, we ask that you come into our personal lives and bring love, that you remind us that you love each and every person that we interact with and that you created them. Give us your eyes to see them and your heart for loving them. God, we ask all of these things and we bring them all before you, asking that in addition to ourselves, that you will bring hope and peace and joy and love to our community, that those who are struggling with grief this season, that you will surround them with your peace and joy and hope and love, that those that are struggling with depression, for those who will have an empty seat at the table, for those who have received difficult medical news, for those who are traveling long distance or not very far at all, God, that they will turn their eyes to you and seek to grow in their faith with you as we are. And God, we ask that you use us as your beacons of hope, peace, joy, and love in all situations that we will face in the coming weeks and months. We join our voices together in the prayer that your son taught his disciples and us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Our second scripture is from the book of Luke, chapter 1, verses 39 through 56, and it reads as follows. In those days, Mary set out and went with haste to a Judean city in the hill country, where she entered the house of Zechariah and greeted Elizabeth. When Elizabeth heard Mary's greeting, the child leapt in her womb, and Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit and exclaimed with a loud cry, Blessed are you among women, and blessed is the fruit of your womb. And why has this happened to me? that the mother of my Lord comes to me. For as soon as I heard the sound of your greeting and the child in my womb leapt for joy, 
and blessed is she who believes that there would be a fulfillment of what was spoken to her by the Lord. And Mary said, My soul magnifies the Lord, and my spirit rejoices in God my Savior, for he has looked with favor on the lowliest of his servants. Surely, from now on, all generations will call me blessed, and the Mighty One has done great things for me. And holy is his name. His mercy is for those who fear him from generation to generation. He has shown strength with his arm. He has scattered the proud and the thoughts of their heart. He has brought down the powerful from the thrones and lifted up the lowly. He has filled the hungry with good things and sent the rich away empty. He has helped his servant Israel in remembrance of his mercy, according to the promise he made to our ancestors, to Abraham and his descendants forever. And Mary remained with her about three months and then returned to her home. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. A question I get asked often in my life is this. How on earth did you end up moving from Northern Ireland to Florida? And normally, I give the short, short version of the answer, which is simply to say that Margaret and I had an opportunity and we took it. But this is a sermon, so there's no need for the short version of anything, right? The story starts way back in the year 2000, when I began my work as the youth director at a church called East Belfast Mission. In my initial conversation with my new boss, before I had even started the job, he let me know that I would be working with an intern there, a young American man by the name of Britt, who would be moving from Orlando in Florida to Northern Ireland. He was coming over to spend a couple of years there to serve in a local church and to explore his own call to ministry. Well, he and I ended up sharing a house together and working together for a couple of years. Ultimately, Britt's time in Northern Ireland came to an end. He answered that call to ministry, moved to North Carolina to attend Duke Seminary, and ultimately was sent to be the associate pastor of First United Methodist Church in Orlando. During all of this, Margaret and I had met, dated, got engaged and married, and not too long after that, we received an opportunity to move to Florida ourselves. I became the youth director at First United Methodist Church in Port St. Lucie, where we served for three wonderful years until it was time to return home, just after Eva was born. When we returned to Northern Ireland, I then began the ordination process myself in the Irish Methodist Church. Those three years in Port St. Lucie had been formative for us, and our friendships there were so strong that even after we had returned home, we would save hard every year so that we could come back there to visit our friends. In fact, we came back so many times that we actually ended up wondering if God might be calling us to move here again, and so we decided that it might be worth knocking on some doors. The First United Methodist Church in Port St. Lucie is part of the Atlantic Central District in the Florida Conference. And at that time, it had just been appointed a new district superintendent by the name of Gary Spencer. Now, when I heard that name, I thought, gosh, that sounds familiar. Well, that's because it was. You see, prior to becoming a district superintendent, Gary had served at First United Methodist Church in Orlando, where my friend Britt had been his associate pastor. As they say in life, it's not what you know, it's who you know. So I believe that this was a door worth knocking on. I got Gary's address and I wrote him an email that said something like this. Dear Gary, I'm a newly ordained minister in the Irish Methodist Church and would love to move to Florida and minister here. I'd like to talk to you about that. What do you think? Oh, by the way, I believe we have a mutual friend 
in your and colleague in your former associate minister Brit. He and I shared ministry and a home back in the days in Belfast. So I think it was actually the last part of that email that caught Gary's attention and he agreed to meet with me. We met casually in August 2012 over a pot of frozen yogurt. We connected immediately and talked at length and with excitement about ministry and mission and the church and of course our mutual friend Britt. Gary gave me some advice on what to do and who to email about opportunities coming up maybe in the Florida conference, but it wasn't that hopeful. And then our meeting was over and that was that. While the chat had gone well, I thought I actually didn't leave thinking that I was likely to ever hear from Gary again. But long story short, he did contact me the following February, saying that he now had a church that he would like me to come and pastor. You see, something had happened when we met. In our conversation, the Holy Spirit had been at work and had moved in a way that would ultimately, down the road, change the lives for Margaret, Eva, Jackson, and myself. In October 2013, the four of us and our dog, Ralph, flew into Orlando. We began our ministry in Titusville. We'd never looked back. All because a holy connection that had been made with Brit in the year 2000 and because of a holy conversation that took place with Gary in summer 2012. Holy connection and holy conversation. When God's people enter into holy connection and conversation with one another, marvelous, surprising, life-altering, even world-changing things can happen. The Gospel writer Luke shows us that very same thing in what we have read today from chapter 1. You more than likely know what has been happening prior to this in Luke's telling. Mary has been visited by the angel Gabriel, who has told her that she is to have a child, that she is to call him Jesus. The angel also says to her that her older cousin Elizabeth is also pregnant and is going to have a son. Mary wonders how all of this can be. The angel reminds her that with God, nothing will be impossible, which Mary opens herself to and closes that section saying, well then, here I am, a servant of the Lord. Let it be with me according to your word. Our reading today starts with Luke telling us that Mary sets out then with haste to go and see Elizabeth. Now, we don't actually know the specific reason that she makes that 80-mile trip. Some people have suggested that the fact that she was pregnant and out of wedlock would have brought shame and disgrace upon her at the time. So she just had to escape that for a while. Others have suggested that perhaps she just wanted to go and visit her pregnant cousin, Elizabeth, and offer any help that she could. Actually, the reason for her visit is ultimately inconsequential. What is important is what happens when she gets there, because what happens is holy connection and holy conversation. Now, if you were in church with us last week for our cantata, you will remember how I noted that the Holy Spirit often works to open up our minds to something new when we are reading a very familiar passage of the Bible. That very thing happened for me last week as we read those scriptures and as we heard the stories of those scriptures sung by our choir. And you know what? It happened again for me this week as I was reading this text to prepare to preach it. You've heard me say before that a temptation that I can often have when I come across a very familiar text is to skim all the way over it, saying to myself that I know what happens in this part. But when I slow down a little bit and take my time with a text, it's now fairly normal for me to notice something new. You see, that's what we mean when we refer to the Scriptures as the living Word of God. Somehow, by the power of the Spirit of God, these ancient words still speak, my friends. Amen? Yes, they absolutely do. So there I was this week, reading this very familiar text. Mary visits Elizabeth, blah, blah, blah. Mary sings a very familiar but nonetheless inspirational song. My soul magnifies the Lord, yada, yada, yada. We've read all of this before. We read it every year. Now, before you run me out of town for being a heretic, let me add that thankfully I caught myself on and went back and started to read it again. 
Only this time I read it aloud and I tried to say the words how I imagined Elizabeth and Mary might have spoken them to one another. Luke tells us that Elizabeth heard Mary's greeting and the wee one that she was carrying within leapt in her womb and that she was filled then with the Holy Spirit. Something actually happened within her and she recognized all of this as God's spirit at work. And then Luke tells us that she exclaimed with a loud cry, blessed are you among women and blessed is the fruit of your womb. She excitedly talks for a couple more sentences then before stopping. In most versions of the Bible, there is a section break at this point. In the Bible that I read, there's a section break with a subheading before the story continues. Mary's Song of Praise. And whilst it is certainly the case that Mary's Song of Praise is deserving of some attention all on its own, I'm actually pretty sure that that break was not there in Luke's original text. And that Luke actually wants us to see the holy connection between these two women, as much as Luke wants us to pay attention to the words of Mary's song. So let's actually try reading it again without the break. Elizabeth recognizes God's spirit at work. And Luke tells us that she exclaimed with a loud cry, Blessed are you among women, Mary, and blessed is the fruit of your womb. And why has the Lord allowed this to happen to me, that the mother of my Lord comes to me? For as soon as I heard the sound of your greeting, the child in my womb, it leapt for joy. And blessed is she who believed that there would be a fulfillment of what was spoken to her by the Lord. Well, then Mary said, my soul magnifies the Lord, Elizabeth, and my spirit rejoices in God, my Savior, for he has looked with favor on the lowliness of his servant. Surely, from now on, all generations will call me blessed, for the Mighty One has done great things for me, and holy is his name. Now, doesn't that make it sound a little bit different? Doesn't that help you hear the holy connection that was alive in this holy conversation. These women are testifying to each other as to what God is doing in their lives. It's an encouragement for each other. When one speaks of her experience of God, the other is built up and begins then to speak of her own experience of God. These are two very ordinary women building one another up simply by sharing their experiences of the power and of the closeness of God. Doesn't that make you hungry for a similar holy connection that might spark a similar holy conversation and make your soul come alive in a similar way? It's conversations like that that were foundational in the early growth of the Methodist movement. I mean, yes, there was preaching and there was social outreach and action and many people were converted because of those things. But what sustained them in their new Christian faith, what gave life to them in an ongoing manner was that new co converts became a part of a small group in which the participants would offer testimony to one another of how they had seen God at work in their lives. Holy connections and holy conversations. Yes, Bible study was centrally important, but the very leaders of the Methodist movement knew well that the magic sauce of discipleship in Methodism was the small group meeting that they knew as the class meeting. Thomas Cook and Francis Asbury in the 1798 Doctrines and Disciplines of the Methodist Episcopal Church in America wrote the following. We have no doubts, but meetings of Christian brothers and sisters for the exposition of scripture texts may be attended with their advantages. But the most profitable exercise of any is a free inquiry into the state of the heart. We therefore confine these meetings to Christian experience, only adjoining singing and prayer in the introduction and conclusion, and we praise the Lord. They have been made a blessing to scores of thousands. In short, we can truly say that through the grace of God, 
Our classes form the pillars of our work. Holy connection and holy conversation. It's what Mary and Elizabeth experienced in the visitation that we have read of in Luke chapter 1. It's what brought about vitality and growth in the very earliest days of the Methodist movement. And my friends, it's what we need, it's what we all need to experience vitality and growth in our own faith journeys today. In this real life Advent story of a visit between pregnant cousins, we read of a real life holy connection and conversation that was life giving and testified to the power of God to be at work in our very real lives. My friends, in an age in which we have become most disconnected, in an age when we seem to find it harder to connect with one another and to testify with one another as to the work of God in our lives. In an age when we prefer sometimes to sit in a study and listen to the voice of an expert and not really interact that much with it. In that kind of age, the call to connect with one another, to make holy connections with one another, to have holy conversations with one another is a real and a much needed call. In the last six or seven months, we have been working here at Memorial to develop a, a, a modern approach to these class meetings. You might have heard them mentioned several times in worship in recent months. And Andy Foote, one of our church members, one of our teachers, has been teaching a book just simply called The Class Meeting, invite, inviting people to understand the importance of getting together and testifying to how God is at work in our lives. In 2023, going forward, this will continue to be a central part of our work. And if your heart has been stirred today by the call to be engaging in holy connections and holy conversations, just like Elizabeth and Mary did, just like the early Methodists did, if you find yourself hungry for that, then I want to invite you to become part of the new class that is starting early in January in which you will learn how to have these holy conversations. You'll learn of the importance of them. And you'll actually begin to experience them. When we testify to the power of God in our very real world, friends, we build one another up and we encourage one another to do the same. And we are reminded that this very real God is very much in the middle of our very real world. And ultimately, that is the story that's right at the heart of a real life Advent. I hope that you'll plan to join in and take part in holy connection and holy conversation with one another, and that you will find growth and depth and life in doing so. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. My friends, at the end of each sermon in our digital service, you have now got used to the fact that we put up a couple of questions just to help you chew through what we've just been talking about. So here are this week's questions. Friends, that brings us to the close of our digital worship service today. As always, we want to thank you for joining with us. We hope that you have found life in this service wherever you are in the world and that you know the closeness of God's presence. 
I want to invite you warmly to join in with us in worship in the days ahead. Obviously, it's now Christmas week coming upon us. We have a number of services taking place here on Christmas Eve at Memorial. You can join us in person at 3.30. That will be our children's and family service. And if you want to come be a part of that, please, that's going to take place in the sanctuary. Then we worship at 5 p.m. in Maxwell Hall for a contemporary Christmas. 7 p.m. back here in the sanctuary for a very traditional worship service. And then at 9 p.m. we'll have a quieter service of Holy Communion uh, in the sanctuary here. So please plan to come along and join us. Our digital Christmas Eve service will go out at 7 p.m. on our YouTube channel on Christmas Eve. So if you can't join us in person, please plan to join us there. You'll be blessed by that experience. I just know it. On Christmas Day, we gather for one service right here in the sanctuary and we will gather at 10 a.m. We hope that you will come along, let your kids come, bring their gifts. If you want to wear your Christmas pajamas, feel free to do that as well. It's a time to come together and celebrate the birth of the Christ child. Friends, I hope that you'll plan to join us some way over Christmas. And more than anything, of course, from Memorial to you, wherever you are, we wish you a very Merry Christmas. Now I leave with this benediction. Beloved children of God, go in peace from this worship service today as those who have been called to make holy connections and have holy conversations with one another. Go in peace today to build up and encourage one another by the testimony of your witness to the power of God's presence in your life. Go in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.